Horror is one of the most popular gaming genres of all time, and many games have tried their hand to be the perfect horror game. However, one game perfects horror unlike any other. I'm of course talking about the original Fire to Freddy's game. This game is kind of old at this point. I mean, it just turned 10 years old today. However, despite its age, I think a lot of people forget just how terrifying this game was when it first came out. This game was unlike anything we had ever seen before, and for its 10 year anniversary, I want to dive back into this game and analyse what made it so unbelievably scary. In order to do that however, we have to first go back to 2014. The year was 2014. Horror games were, as usual, extremely popular, especially among Let's Players, who over-exaggerated their fear to the games to gain more views. Most horror games were not scary. While there were some outliers such as Amnesia and Slenderman, I would argue that most horror games operated in a similar modem, and in retrospect, these were all the same game. You had to complete some kind of objective, which was usually to just escape, or collect things to escape, and along the way, you would have to come face to face with whatever evil monster was presented to you. Now, these games were very repetitive. However, 2014 held way to another style of horror, which was taking the world by storm. Creepy pastas. For those who don't remember, don't know what I'm talking about, or just need a refresher, a creepypasta was a horror story or horror related legend that found its origins on and was spread by via the internet. Think Jeff the Killer, The Rake, Eyeless Jack, and most notably Slenderman. Now Slenderman was the first horror game that truly embraced the creepypasta trope into its games, but surprisingly, Slenderman's original story wasn't related to the video game. However, a large number of creepypastas revolved around video games, most notably Ben Drown and Hero Brian. The idea of a creepypasta messing with video games, or video games becoming haunted, was extremely popular. You may be curious why I'm bringing this up, and you'll just have to keep watching because I'm going to be explaining soon enough. Now let's talk about the actual star of the show here, Scott Cawthon, the creator of Fire to Freddy's. After having a wide variety of games that completely failed, Scott took some criticism from his last game, Chipper and Sons, and how the characters looked like animatronics, and ran with it. Fire to Freddy's was released on August 8th, 2014, and this game blew up. Many famous YouTubers of today got their first bit of success playing this game, and one creator in particular shines out of the rest, Markiplier. Markiplier's Let's Play as the original Fire to Freddy's game was instrumental to this game's success, and it can be traced to one video. On the flip side. Oh, you. oh god! What the fuck? What the fuck? Okay! Titling the video was that Golden Freddy. Markiplier unknowingly sparked the community to begin speculating. Remember how I brought up creepy pastors? Well, Golden Freddy became one of those creepy pastors. Many people believed the game was haunted, and not only did this phenomenon happen with Golden Freddy, but the game itself was just extremely creepy and unsettling. There was just something about this game, and it sparked a ton of mystery, intrigue, and even creepypastas to be made, which in the day and age of the internet, especially in 2014, allowed this game to blow up all over the world. So, let's now actually look at the game itself and try to identify how the original Fire to Freddy's game perfected horror. For starters, let's discuss the basic premise of Fire to Freddy's to understand what the objective of the game is. You have been hired as a security guard for Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, a popular children's place featuring a cast of animatronic mascots, very similar to Chuck E. Cheese. You are working the night shift however, from 12am to 6am, where the animatronics act very differently to how they usually do during the game. Instead of staying powered off on the stage, they are allowed to stay on and freely walk around the building at night. And we are told that if they see us, they will assume that we are an anti endoskeleton without its costume on rather than a person, and since it's against the rules, they will forcefully stuff you inside a Freddy Fazbear suit, which, due to the wires and animatronic devices found inside the suit, would result in your death. So, you have to use the doors, lights, and cameras found in your office to prevent the four animatronic threats from reaching you. However, you need to use your resources as sparingly as possible, as you will otherwise run out of your precious, limited power you have. This game is quite frankly a nightmare scenario. The first and most notable thing that you can tell of when loading up the game is unlike every other horror game before it, you, the player, cannot move. 
You are trapped in this office and are completely unable to escape. Well, you have to deal with these threats that are coming for you specifically. It's one of the most unique concepts for a horror game, or at least it was at the time of release. The first thing about this game that absolutely assisted in its distinct horror was this gameplay. But something else that really made this game scary was the choice of monster, so to speak. Animatronics were unexplored, but I believe it was quite a fantastic choice for a horror game antagonist. The fact is, animatronics are something that everyone finds a little creepy to an extent. Real animatronics are unnerving and obviously can't walk around. But why are animatronics so scary? Well, it's because they fall perfectly into the uncanny valley, being neither human nor object, being somewhere in the middle resembling a human creation but acting quite different. This immediately creates an unnerving feeling for the player before even learning of the character's ability to move around. Now, for this video, I want to break down the three aspects that make this game so unbelievably terrifying. Those three things are the gameplay, the characters and visuals, and the audio. I also have a fourth aspect, which I will reveal later on, so keep watching for that. But for now, let's talk about the gameplay. As we established before, Five Nights at Freddy's has a drastically different gameplay style to every horror game that came before it, and as a result, just the pure shock of being unable to move made a ton of people scared the first time they play it. But why is not moving so scary? Well, it's because what to come is unavoidable. Normally in horror games, you are able to brace yourself for a scare because the scare is focused around you moving around. You turning a corner, you brace for the jump scare. There's a dark hall ahead, brace yourself. In Far Into Freddy's, every single moment is a moment of bracing because you are trapped and the threats are coming for you. There's no preparing yourself, you just have to be prepared and that fear is powerful. Now, obviously, you aren't completely defenseless, as you have two massive doors that will block out any threats from making it to your office, as well as lights and a camera system to monitor where everyone is in the building. However, all this chips away at your extremely, and I mean extremely, precious power supply. Every action you take has its consequences, so you gotta make sure you don't waste any power at all. This dread sits with you, and because of how long the nights are, that fear sits with you for a while. As you think you are on top of things, by when you reach 4am you realise you only have 18% power, you start to question yourself. You take more risks to try and lower the power, and suddenly Foxy comes sprinting down the hall and you're dead. It's a risk and reward system and it creates a ton of tension for the player. Now speaking of Foxy running down the hall, let's talk about the four characters and how they force the player to submit to a pattern in order to avoid death. Bonnie is the first character that you will have to deal with, and he has a habit of speeding across to your door, which gives the illusion that he's more aggressive and as a result you end up seeing him way more. He causes you to basically spam the left door light as he attacks so often, you gotta make sure he won't just jump you. Chica is basically the same as Bonnie, but on the right side. She's more slow, hiding in the kitchen a lot of the time, and while you can hear her, it's easy to forget about her. She's not nearly as aggressive as Bonnie and tries to sneak in rather than just power through. Foxy is probably the biggest stressor of them all, as his mechanic is entirely reliant on you keeping track of him. Bonnie and Chica will show up to your door no matter what you do, while Foxy requires you to use the camera in order to fend him off. Not only that, but if you fail to keep him at bay, he will speed to your door and actually take away some of your power. He just starts with 1% and takes 5% extra every time he hits the door, meaning you best do your part in keeping him locked down or your power is going to plummet fast. Freddy has to be the most unsettling, and I'll get to him later, but in terms of gameplay, once again, you have to keep him locked down. Freddy's mechanic is the most complicated, and as a result, you will really feel the shift of gameplay when he moves. Freddy to me feels like the distraction that draws your attention away from the other threats, and makes you feel hopeless. He wants to demotivate you more than actually kill you. Freddy does a really good job distracting the player the first time, as from personal experience of helping people during their first playthrough, every time Freddy starts moving, they suddenly forget how to play and start dying over and over again. It's quite remarkable how just one new character can completely change the way that you play the game. And it all happens right in front of your very eyes. In fact, the camera encourages fear. When you are in the camera, you are separated from the rest of the world, 
Anything happening in your office is unavailable to you, and tension strikes if you cannot locate a character in the camera system. Lowering the camera has the opposite effect. You have no way of telling where the characters are and how close they may be. Foxy may be running down the hall right now, you don't know. And that fear can cause panic, which is perfectly setting the player up to be viciously jump scared. The separation is genius. You never know what will be lurking on the other side of the camera. And what you see on camera is so creepy that even when you think you are safe, you really aren't. And speaking of which, I think it's time we talk about the visual, and more importantly, how the character designs are extremely effective for a horror game. Like I said before, having the cast of creatures hunting you down be animatronics was an excellent choice, but just having animatronic threats isn't enough. You also have to have the designs of the characters be great, so you are actually scared of them. But I think that the original game did the best out of any game in creating effective designs for the viewer to be scared of. The original game only has four main characters, and all of them offer something different in terms of horror. One thing this game does amazingly is create a personal connection with each animatronic threat, allowing the player to fully appreciate the horrors that they are witnessing. Let's go through the characters and discuss what makes each one work so well. For starters, Bonnie. I credited Bonnie for having the best character design in the whole series, and I honestly stand by that. Bonnie may not be the namesake of this series, but my god does he work as one of the main threats. Bonnie is consistently the most scary character in most games, and while I don't think he is the scariest character overall, in terms of character designs, he is up there. Bonnie was so scary that the creator had nightmares about him. I think what makes Bonnie so scary is the simplicity of his design. Bonnie can be summed up as, less is more. For starters, Bonnie is obviously really similar to Freddy in terms of the design. Having his body be a, basically a copy of Freddy, but with a purple colour and red bow tie. However, his head features no eyebrows and really no defining features, which both makes him the most realistic since most animatronics are more simple in design and also makes him completely emotionless. It's the blank stare of Bonnie that makes him so terrifying. And that's not even taking into consideration some of Bonnie's more frightening frames, like the backstage camera shots. In my mind, I think both of these shots are horrifying. Seeing Bonnie in this camera really emphasizes just how large these animatronics are, which is one of their strongest attributes towards their fear. Bonnie's ears make him the large of the bunch, and you can really see that as he wanders the halls. I think his door light render, while not perfect, does a great job illuminating how big and close Bonnie actually is. I think Bonnie's render is the weakest here, and if you look at a game like FNAF Rewritten, you can see how it could work way better. Bonnie's jump scare on the other hand is one of the stronger ones, and I do mean that. Bonnie's jump scare perfectly captures the horror of Fire to Freddy's, I mean, there's a reason his jump scare frame worked so well for Markiplier's first video. Bonnie's blank stare is front and centre in his jump scare, and he watches you the whole time, which makes this jump scare so much more effective. What's more is that this is the most involved jump scare with Bonnie's jaw biting down. It's one of my all time favourites. However, as much as I keep gliding on, there's other characters to talk about. I mean, speaking of the blank stare, Chica is king of this. Chico in my mind probably has the weakest design overall in this game, but don't let that fool you. She's every bit as terrifying as the rest. She undoubtedly is king in the creepy department. Her blank gaze and unhinged jaw give, once again, a very emotionless and dead feeling to the character, which is again one of the animatronic strong suits. The idea of a lifeless threat is inherently creepy. Chica embodies this the best out of the main crew. And while I don't think she's the scariest, she's very dead and creepy. I think everyone was a bit creeped out too with the let's eat bit. It gives a sense of cannibalism somehow, and it makes the players scared of her. Chica also has the most unnatural angles when on camera, especially in the dining room and the east hallway. Not to mention the corner and probably her most terrifying position, the window outside your office. Chica looking at you through the window is undoubtedly the creepiest thing you will see lurking from the darkness of the halls, and although this sound is not tied to Chica directly at the window, the slight banging sounds that play from time to time work very well when she's at the window. 
She's definitely seen as less aggressive, but she works effectively as a support role in the hunt for you. Her jump scare is again creepy and her jaw and eyes work well to terrify the player, and it shows off her size extremely well. Although it's safe to say that Chiku is probably the least popular character, I think that she is the least effective of generating horror of the main four. Foxy is probably the fan favourite of the bunch, and I think a large reason for that was the mystery surrounding his character from the very beginning of Final Fantasy Freddy's. The location of Pirate Cove in Final Fantasy Freddy's is an unusual one, and I think people forget the horror of the out of order location, especially when paired alongside the Bite of 87 mystery. The first time seeing Foxy appear from behind the curtain is a memory I think every Final Fantasy Freddy's fan remembers well. Foxy's design works well. He's the most unorthodox and least kid-friendly of the bunch, spouting a sharp pirate hook and a mouthful of pointy teeth. He once again looks dead and lifeless, and he's the only character of the main four who actively looks broken. His body is full of holes, and his endoskeleton is very much exposed, showcasing a massive amount of unpredictability with his appearance. He is easily the most mysterious of the core group, and his gameplay complements this. Let's not forget Foxy's most iconic moment, when he escapes the cove and dashes down the hall. Actually seeing an animatronic move on a camera system that has shown nothing but still images up to this point really sells how screwed you are, and why Foxy works so well as a character. If you have the door closed, you will hear a loud banging showing you are not safe. If you're unfortunate enough to not have the door closed, well, you know what happens. And speaking of this, I do think that Foxy has the weakest jump scare. It's not terrible by any means, and it's creepy to see just how big Foxy actually is, but it definitely isn't as effective as the other characters, as the in your face end is way more effective. However, when talking about effective jump scares, we have to draw attention to the very last character of the original crew, the star of the show himself, Freddy Fazbear. Personally, I think Freddy is the most terrifying character in Final Fantasy Freddy's 1. This was the game that made Freddy Fazbear the star of the show, the final boss, the ultimate test. Bonnie is the most uneasy, Chica is the most unnerving, Foxy is the most mysterious, and Freddy is the combination of all these factors. Before Freddy even moves from the show stage, we get a glimpse of his creepiness through his gaze into the camera. Freddy seems to be the most alive of everyone, but not in a natural way. Once Freddy starts the move, his laugh and always present gaze haunts the player throughout the game. All of Freddy's angles are in the darkness, hiding just out of view except for when he's right outside your door. And Freddy's jump scare is easily the most terrifying. Freddy has two of these and both are haunting. The least effective of these two is Freddy's blackout, where the power goes out and Freddy comes to personally kill you. The build up is haunting, with the children's music box ended by silence and a blood curdling scream. Freddy's office jump scare however is the most unpredictable and most terrifying, being able to jump scare you at any time. What's more is that this is the scariest image in the whole game, well besides one thing. Freddy is one of the scariest characters of all time, however to explore exactly what makes Freddy so terrifying, we need to talk about the audio. Now for those who haven't seen Scruffy's video on this game, the sound design in this game is absolutely the best part. To start, the ambience is extremely creepy and unsettling. This constant hum and drone of an unknown, seemingly metallic source. Not only that, but the whirring sounds of the cameras creates this distance between you and the information you need to survive, such as the animatronics footsteps, the robotic gurgling they make when at the corner, this vaguely human vocal, or Chica rummaging through the kitchen. However, the number one biggest sound distraction is the fan. It's not a surprise or mystery that the fan is a huge part of what makes FNAF's audio work. Every sound is quiet and hard to hear over the loud buzzing of the fan. However, every sound that you can hear that is clear is bone chilling. Bringing our attention back to Freddy for a moment, Freddy's laugh is one of the most iconic and one of the most unsettling and terrifying sounds in all of Fire to Freddy's. Even though it's literally just a slowed down version of a child's laugh, it works so well and haunts the hell out of the player. The sound design does a great job of creating a supernatural feel and ambience throughout the game. Freddy's laugh is a perfect example. Another great attribute is the juxtaposition of a children's pizzeria alongside horrifying monsters that hunt you at night. Circus tunes, 
singing, and of course, the Toreador March, a staple of Fire at the Freddy's, and a juxtaposition for your inevitable death. Surprisingly, the most calming sound in the game is the silence after a jump scare. Beating a knight is a bittersweet moment, the charms of 6am cut off by an almost morbidly comedic start to the next night. I won't go as in depth in the audio as Scruffy did, as he has a great video on it, so if you're interested, go check him out. But I want to take this moment to address one final thing, that I think made Final Fantasy Freddy's 1 stand the test of time and stand along the greats of horror games, and that is its concept and perfect formula for creepypasta and the mystery through its iconic, and at the time, unknown lore. Without a doubt, the original Final Fantasy Freddy's game was built for horror, and nothing showed that more than the creepy passes that came from this game. It was built for it. The lore of Final Fantasy Freddy's at this point was summed up by easter eggs. There was nothing more to it. Final Fantasy Freddy's 1's easter eggs are some of the most terrifying and unsettling things in all of Final Fantasy Freddy's, and for this section, I want you to forget everything you know about the established lore of the games. Imagine that this game is the only one that exists as it once was. No Mimic, no Books, no William Afton, no Springtrap, no Final Fantasy Freddy's 2, just Final Fantasy Freddy's 1. Now imagine playing through Final Fantasy Freddy's. The game itself is already terrifying, and then all of a sudden, you get flashes of a nightmarish close-up of Freddy with bloodshot eyes, and it's me flashing on your screen. And this It's Me is everywhere. When Foxy leaves Pirate Cove, it's written on the sign. It's written on the walls. You see it everywhere. <laughs> then take into consideration the crying children on the wall, the missing children's newspapers that appear on the wall, how five children went missing, and how the bodies were never found, yet the animatronics begin to smell, and it doesn't take a genius to put two and two together and learn that the kids were stuffed inside the animatronics. And when you see how the animatronics behave, you begin to wonder if there's more behind their behaviour than just their programming. And then you hear the garbled talk of the animatronics, the phone calls, how the night fire phone call is reduced to gibberish after phone guy is killed in front of us by something. The scream from the animatronic is iconic, but when you hear the scream on the phone, it's not the same. Except for one character. <laughs> Without a doubt, Golden Freddy is the most terrifying character in this game. And he is the representation of the supernatural in this story. The terrifying and disgusting story of a mysterious killer who killed five children and stuffed their bodies into the suit. The very suits that hunt you down. The same suits that throughout the day represent innocence, which are torn away by the sheer terror you witness at night. Nothing could have prepared you for this, and you are alone. You wonder how it's possible. You wonder if the game is haunted. You wonder if the person you're playing as is really who you think they are. You think they are just another Joe like you and me, needing to make a buck, but any sane person would have left after night one. But no, you are different. You are something else. You are... the reason behind this. Okay, okay, I know this is clutching of straws, I know it's not the story, but I hope that showed just how creepy and creative one can get with the story. This setting is perfect for creepy stories, and even outside the lore, there was room to explore, questions to be answered, and it was up to us to answer them. The fear of the creepypasta from Final Fantasy Freddy's and the mystery haunted us. And although Final Fantasy Freddy's is definitely not the same as it used to be 10 years ago, it did something. It connected us. It allowed us to explore unforeseen possibilities. The gameplay, the concept, the characters, the lore. It was all super intriguing. And even through all of it, it was terrifying in one of the scariest horror games ever made. And in my mind, it perfected horror. No game ever makes you feel as unsettled as a FNAF game. While Final Fantasy Freddy's 1 may not be the scariest horror game, hell, not even the scariest Final Fantasy Freddy's games, as even some fan games are way scarier. But the scariest ones take inspiration from this game. Think A Shadow Over Freddy's, Fazbear Night, A Graveyard Shift at Freddy's. This game series is so iconic, and it started with this game. This masterpiece of a game and while I know it has not aged the best, it does an amazing job at captivating viewers 
and it's no wonder it took over the world. Whew, well that was a mouthful. I hope you all enjoyed my homage of the 10th year anniversary of Final Fantasy Freddy's. To think this game is 10 years old is insane, as I remember playing this game all the way back in the school library when I was 13. It's so insane to think about, but I still remember vividly all the fear myself and everyone else I was with felt. This game holds a soft spot in my heart, and it's part of the reason I'm streaming this game over 100 days. I know, I'm a masochist. By the way, very randomly too, I want to ask, if anyone knows how to code a custom 6 hour mode in Final Fantasy Freddy's in VR, please let me know. And if at any point you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. I want to hit 50,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and the support has been so crazy, so thank you all so much. I have more awesome videos coming soon, so stay tuned for that. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you in the next video.